Hello, and welcome to Encounters with Polish Literature, brought to you by the Polish Cultural Institute in New York. I'm David Goldfarb, and I'll be your host. On February 24th, 2022, after we recorded our previous episode about Adam Mickiewicz, but before we released it on YouTube, Russia's army invaded the territory of Poland's neighbor Ukraine, starting a war of the sort that most of us did not expect to see again on the European continent in our lifetimes. While in times of peace, we may debate the history of tensions between Poland and Ukraine, between ethnic Ukrainians and Jews, between Poles of different political stripes, the massive outpouring of grassroots support in Poland and elsewhere for Ukrainian refugees fleeing this unprovoked attack and for Ukrainian fighters defending their country and defending democracy in Europe has demonstrated that the recognition of our common humanity and belief in democratic values are what really counts when push comes to shove, which is not an empty cliche in this situation. In light of this dramatic historical turn, we would like to open our platform on encounters with Polish literature to learn more about Ukrainian literature and cultural connections between Ukraine and Poland. And we'll be adjusting our calendar to include some special episodes on Ukrainian Polish topics featuring leading scholars and translators of Ukrainian literature into English and our first author on the show, Ukrainian-Polish writer Janna Swonioska, whose novel, The House with the Stained Glass Window, was translated into English not too long ago by our friend and recent guest, Antonia Lloyd-Jones. The topic of today's episode is Ukrainian writer, poet, translator, and performer Yuri Andruhovich, born in 1960. He has translated Polish writers into Ukrainian, collaborated with Polish writer Andrzej Stashuk, and is himself well translated into English. Before we meet today's guest, I'd like to thank everyone who has been following along with Encounters with Polish Literature. If you like what you hear on the program, click the thumbs up down below. Ring the bell to get notifications about new episodes. Follow the playlist of all of our episodes in the description of the program. Leave a comment if you can. And please click the subscribe button to show the Polish Cultural Institute in New York that you are interested and would like to hear more about Polish literature, its past and present, here on Encounters with Polish Literature. My good friend of many years, Vitaly Chernetsky, is a professor of Slavic languages and literatures and an affiliate of film and media studies, Jewish studies, science fiction studies, and women, gender, and sexuality studies at the University of Kansas. A native of Odessa, Ukraine, he received his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and previously taught at Columbia, Northeastern, and Miami University of Ohio. He is the author of Mapping Post-Communist Cultures, Russia and Ukraine in the Context of Globalization, published by McGill Queens University Press in 2007 and translated into Ukrainian in 2013, and of articles on modern and contemporary Slavic and East European literatures and cinema, where he seeks to highlight cross-regional and cross-disciplinary contexts. A book uh, in Ukrainian, um, Intersections and Breakthroughs, Ukrainian Literature and Cinema Between the Global and the Local is in press. He co-edited a bilingual anthology of contemporary Ukrainian poetry, Letters from Ukraine, uh, published in 2016, and an annotated Ukrainian translation of Edward Said's Culture and Imperialism in 2007. His translations into English include Yuri Andrukhovich's novels, the Moskaviad in uh, 2008 and 12 Circles in 2015, and a volume of his selected poems, Songs for a Dead Rooster, translated and published in 2018 with Ostapkin. He is past president of the American Association for Ukrainian Studies and the current first vice president of the Shevchenko Scientific Society in the U.S. Welcome to the program, Vitaly. It's great to see you here. Wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. All right. Uh, we wish it was a better occasion, but uh, of course. but uh, of course, but uh, but it's it's uh, really great to be able to do something together again. Um, so I was thinking maybe you could you know lay out the landscape of Polish and Ukrainian literary relations since Poland and Ukraine are neighbors. Um, they're obviously audiences for each other's writers. Um, there are uh, uh, Ukrainians living in Poland uh, who speak Ukrainian, many Poles in Western, or many uh, Ukrainians in Western Ukraine uh, speak uh, Polish, obviously Poles speak Polish as well. Uh, so what's the, what's the landscape like? 
Uh, well, uh, first of all, there is a very uh, deep and rich history of dialogue, which goes as far back, I would say, that at least the Renaissance era and possibly even late Middle Ages. So uh, definitely after the, uh, the, the, the uh, duchy of the principality of Galicia and Volodymyr, uh, Galicia and Ludomeri, as it became in the Habsburg days, uh, was uh, became part of the Kingdom of Poland. Uh, it certainly started a period of very rich dialogue, and uh, uh, sometimes it was more sort of going both ways. Sometimes it was going more one way, but definitely uh, there is an awareness of the two cultures not always uh, going deep, but always with a certain degree of curiosity. Definitely for uh, Ukrainians, uh, Poland was a source, a you know, conduit of access to the pan-European processes like the Renaissance. So uh, a lot of Western Enlightenment ideas later also came uh, mediated via Poland. So there is that aspect going further back. Then, of course, there is a period of rich interaction in the early 19th century when we have the so-called Ukrainian school in Polish literature and uh, uh, some that what the... Um, Scholars have described the Poles' imagination of Ukraine, Poland, Scotland, so similar role to uh, Scotland in the novels of Sir Walter Scott in Polish national imagination. And uh, then in uh, the context of the mid 19th century and both nations struggle for independence against the oppression by the Russian empire, um, moving uh, from certain past grievances and misunderstandings to the deep understanding of the shared lot and of the need to address it through joint efforts. And uh, so this is something that uh, continued with fits and starts with uh, through history of the 19th and the 20th century. For instance, we have a very complex and rich and you know history of interaction of Ivan Franko, the biggest Ukrainian intellectuals in Western Ukraine at a Habsburg rule in the final decades of the 19th, beginnings of the 20th century, whose uh, lengthiest employment was for Polish uh, newspaper Kurier Lwowski, and uh, who wrote some of his literary works in Polish. And uh, but also had uh, at some point fell out of favor and had a you know a rather controversial relationship with the local Polish community. And uh, then uh, we see more and more of situations of convergence and dialogue and mutual support in the second half of the, 20th century after World War II. And here, especially, is the role of Kultura and Jerzy Gedroitz personally in establishing a dialogue and mutual support and reconciliation despite past problems, grievances, and uh, pain that the two communities have caused each other. So I would say that thanks to those wonderful efforts spearheaded by Gidroitz. Uh, we see over the past three quarters of a century, roughly, a history of mostly very fruitful, very productive, mutually enriching and supportive relationship between Polish and Ukrainian culture, both in the pro-democracy and dissident movements, and also in a rich cultural exchange and in mutual support and mutual interest and uh, collaboration and dialogue. And this became especially uh, important for Ukrainian 
uh, culture in the final uh, years of uh, Soviet rule, in part because uh, Polish press was considerably uh, freer because in Poland we had the Drugi Obieg, the independent publications that also were reaching uh, smuggled uh, Ukrainian intellectuals. And also because Polish culture very often was a source for acquaintance with the rest of the world when translations into Polish became a uh, venue for many Ukrainian intellectuals to find out uh, about many great works of literature, which were banned in the Soviet Union, about philosophical thought and political thought and uh, art and many things of that kind. And uh, then we see it during the post-communist uh, period, several waves of uh, interaction and uh, uh, productive collaboration, some of them in the very early years um, when uh, all of a sudden, you know, the Soviet border is gone and there is a fairly easy possibility of cross-border travel. Then uh, we see a renewed wave in the early 2000s, uh, which largely resulted through unique uh, personal friendship and collaboration of two writers, Ukrainian uh, Yuri Andrukhovich and Polish Andrzej Stasiuk, uh, who were born the same year, 1960, and uh, through their friendship and collaboration, a lot more things have happened. And later we see uh, the role of many of Polish government programs and local and regional programs like the Gau de Polonia stipend, uh, the attention given to Ukrainian writers by the Angelus Prize of the city of Wrocław, in the same Wrocław, the Wrocław Short Story Festival, also repeatedly featuring Ukrainian writers. And in general, Poland became in the last quarter century, the European country which knows the most about Ukrainian culture. So in the case of Poland, you do not need to start explaining things to the extent that you need to the French or the Spanish or the British or the Italians or most others or the Americans, as it may be the case. Uh, uh, the average uh, Polish educated person knows a lot more about Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian music, Ukrainian cinema, Ukrainian culture more broadly than folks from just about any other European country outside Ukraine. One thing that I think is really interesting about the way that you put that is that um, uh, is that you you kind of you know recenter the you know the the discourse for um, for American uh, Slavists. Um, and usually, when uh, I'm speaking with uh, our Russianist colleagues um, about uh, underground literature, they think of it as uh, samizdat, uh, self published. Uh, but mm -hmm. you know, but you refer to it as drugi objekt, which is mm -hmm. uh, the in Polish, the Second Circuit, um, mm -hmm. and uh, really, I mean, they're the same. They're both the underground literature, but uh, they're conceived differently. And I think that uh, that uh, often uh, Russianists don't realize that. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, in other countries, there are other terms for uh, for what this is, and that kind of characterizes it in a, a bit of a different way. I mean, uh, in Polish, the drugi obieg is very much about the circulation. It's about mm -hmm. uh, one person who writes the text, and then there's some kind of you know middleman somewhere else and then maybe there's uh, often a woman who uh, would uh, type five carbon copies uh, on a typewriter uh, of that text and do it repeatedly uh, to produce maybe 20 copies and then that would circulate and it's all about the circulation people who don't know uh, who's at the other end so nobody can uh, turn anyone else in um, and uh, that's different from uh, the concept of mm -hmm. uh, of uh, self-publication yeah. so so that's uh, maybe that's how we need to 
be thinking, you know, in, you know, in Slavic departments about, uh, uh, about what we do, being aware of mm-hmm. what's happening in, uh, in, uh, in different contexts. Um, so, uh, so the, our main focus for today, I think, is going to be uh, Yuri Androkovich, uh, whom you introduced me to uh, first, uh, you know, many years ago. I think I first met him in, in London at a, a Bassis uh, conference uh, where you had invited, invited him or, or set up a, a meeting and you've been Androkovich's uh, primary translator for uh, into English for many years. Um, and uh, and his uh, his connection to to Stashuk, which I, I think has been influential in in uh, in both directions, although they both have their own very distinctive identities. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, his, their collaboration, um, My Europe or Moja Europa, Europa in uh, in Polish, uh, which hasn't been trans the whole text hasn't been translated. I don't think Stashuk's essay, which uh, is something like uh, the ship's logbook. Um, mm-hmm has appeared uh, in uh, in English, and I wasn't able to get a copy to reread it uh, in time for our uh, discussion today. It's uh, it's out in the uh, in the supply chain, as we now call mm-hmm. it. Um, but uh, but uh, but we can talk about uh, his essay um, about Androkovich's essay is called the, the Central East Eastern Revision. What does that title mean? Well, um... I would say that the title is uh, very much part of his ongoing reflection on the notion of Central Europe as uh, and the discourse that uh, became prominent in the late 70s and 80s among primarily exiled uh, intellectuals uh, from uh, Poland, from the then Czecho- existing Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia, something that in uh, uh, Jesse Labov, among others, has written so eloquently in her recent book about this whole discourse of Central Europe. And Androkovich uh, starts writing essays in the early 90s, and uh, his very first essay is called Vstup do Geografi, Introduction to Geography, and it's an ironic title, and it is very much about cultural imagination, where Central Europe exists, and of course it exists in our minds, and the relationship between the past and the present, and this reconstruction of place and time and it is done very much in dialogue with specific cultural figures who are uniting that space, like Bruno Schulz, uh, like uh, Danilo Kish, uh, like uh, uh, others who try to develop that uh, understanding of that play, uh, that state of mind and state of place that has a certain melancholy beauty, that has a certain linkage of past and present, that has, um, that is a place of many ruins, and it's a place of a multiculturalism, but multiculturalism that is in ruins too, great extent because of the traumas of the 20th century, World War II and the Holocaust first and foremost, but also then the legacy of Soviet population resettlings and Stalinist terror and things of that nature. So coming to terms with what now that, you know, Soviet rule collapsed and was gone and what was happening in that part of the world as it was emerging from that period and trying to rediscover itself and um, work through those complex traumas. I think this is the shared concern of both writers, uh, although they approach it through slightly different uh, angles. And in Andruhovich's case, it is um it becomes more of a mythologized relationship with his family and its legacy and this is something very similar to both Schultz and Kish what they do in their writing uh, but uh, also going into the layers of uh, uh, specific uh, spaces and sites uh, of his native city of 
Ivana Frankivsk, uh, Stanislav, uh, uh, Stanislav, if we want to do the Austro-Hungarian Habsburg name, uh, but uh, not only, obviously, Lviv, Lviv, Lemberg, Leopolis. Uh, and um, so that cultural sense, and for Stasiuk, I think it's his fascination with uh, the southeastern Poland and the territories which used to have a significant Ukrainian population that was resettled forcibly through Aktiv Wisła after World War II, and also that shared space um, across, I would say, and around the Carpathians stretching from Poland uh, to Romania and beyond, maybe transitioning into the Balkan mountains. And uh, Andruhovich too, I mean, he is a person of the mountainous part of Ukraine, not of the flat you know, steps of the center and the south. So that is one of those linkages. Uh, Stashuk is very much. I mean, he he. There's a very interesting description of his uh, his method um, in uh, in uh, Dukla mm -hmm. um, that uh, where he talks about uh, you know he talks about his conception of geography. He says my method is primitive. It's like he says Dukla means a small mine shaft dug for exploratory purposes. Is the name of a of a mm -hmm. location. Um, and he says, my method is primitive. It's like drilling at random. In principle, it could be done anywhere. It doesn't make much difference since the world is round, like memory, which begins from a single point, a dot, then spins layers and turns ever widening circles so as to swallow us up and bring about our ruin in utterly unneeded abundance. At that point, we begin to turn around, retreat, pretend we've walked into all of this accidentally by mistake that in fact, someone's taken us for a ride, deceived us as if we were children. And now we all want to, all we want to do is go to our mom to hold on to her skirt and cry from shame and helplessness. I, I remember once I, I did a, a um, I had a, a kind of a, a book club meeting um, about, um, about uh, on the road to Baba Dag, mm -hmm. um, where he's uh, traveling through um, Hungary and Moldova mm -hmm. and and uh, and Romania, and uh, and there were many people there who who came thinking of it as travel literature, which it kind of is. I mean, sometimes Stashuk is described as a travel writer because he writes about locations mm -hmm. and geography, and and he and he's on the move, um, and he's on the road, right? I mean, uh, although that's the yeah. English title and uh, and not in the Polish title. Yeah. Um, but uh, but uh, but in fact, none of the normal tropes of, of mm -hmm. travel writing are there. I mean, he doesn't like meet like, you know, he doesn't meet very many people. Uh, you don't see like some, you know, illiterate, colorful, wise peasant or, you know, or things that, that are familiar for you. We don't have, you know, sumptuous meals in some, you know, country farm or something like that. It's really like the depression, the depressing you know, post-socialist landscape, uh, more decay and ruins, which mm -hmm. is something that he has in common, uh, certainly with Androchovich. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, also, uh, he, yeah, there's kind of a, it's kind of a philosophical poetics, right? I mean, he's looking for um, the pessimistic idea. What what did the land? How did the landscape produce the pessimistic ideas of uh, the Romanian philosopher uh, Emil Chorin? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, which is not, I think, <laughs> what uh, what we're looking for when we're you know vacationing in Provence or something like that. Um, uh, and 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 maybe that uh, yields a very a kind of a different idea of time. I mean, it seems like Andrukovich is much more. Um, it's much more about the history. It's much more. There's much more about like what's uh, you know what's happened. I mean, especially in that in that family story in um, um, uh, in uh, in uh, in the the essay from my Europe um, mm -hmm. that. Um, it's about the objects and, and things that 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 seems very Schultzian, right? I mean that the the ob the object is the source of uh, the source of the poetic inspiration. Yes, uh, I I would agree with you absolutely. For Andruhovich, it is uh, the an object or a particular experience uh, in an encounter with a place that then 
produces uh, uh, layers of going deeper and understanding who you are. Uh, so that's uh, why he called his first collection of essays Disorientation on Location, Desorientatia and Mistsevasti. Uh, and it, uh, so the location is secondary. I guess what would unite him with uh, Stasiuk is that this predilection, I guess, of almost post-Sternian sentimental journey. So that travel is not about encounter of things, but about an intellectual and emotional quest that the person has internally because of a travel experience. But uh, for Andrukhovich, there's not even necessarily has to be a travel. It's a place where may he may be that he tries to then go and dig deeper and then investigate. And you're quite right that it can, does not require even necessarily displacement. It's just thinking of the location of the, where you are and uh, exploring the multiple possibilities of how history and politics traversed that place and how it shaped and changed it. And yes, uh, Schulz, I would say, is a very important intertext. And Andrukhovich, uh, for a long time, was unhappy with the translations of Schulz into Ukrainian that were available. So he finally did it himself. And the canonical translation of Schulz now is by him. He has also translated other things from Polish, notably Tadeusz Konwitzki's A Minor Apocalypse. And that too, I think, was influential for him. Uh, so uh, Moscoviad, Moscoviada, his novel that I've translated into English and which in my opinion is still the best thing written about the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, from the point of person who experienced it from the inside because the book is set in Moscow in 91, but there were defamiliarizing gaze of an insider, outsider, a Soviet person who is not Russian, who is displaced there. And, but the book very much is in dialogue with Konvitsky and um, I think a minor apocalypse definitely um, propelled Andrukhovich to his own reflections that uh, about the role of intellectual and freedom and unfreedom and the choices an intellectual makes. I heard him read from his uh, translations of, uh, of Schultz uh, into Ukrainian at the uh, Bruno Schultz Festival in Drohovich in uh, 2012. And um, uh, if uh, our, uh, our viewers look at, uh, you know, look at the description uh, in, um, on YouTube, um, you can find a link to the, uh, the introductory page to this episode. Uh, and um, there is a, a picture of him reading, um, in reading his translations of Schultz. Uh, I mean, the picture doesn't tell you what he's doing. Uh, he's holding a book, but if, unless you know what the cover looks like, you wouldn't recognize it. Um, uh, of him reading exactly those translations uh, in in, in Drohobich. And uh, it was a very inspiring, inspiring meeting. There were both Poles and Ukrainians there and, and people mm -hmm. from around the world. It was it was uh, it was a, a great event. And one of the things he did um, when Andrukhovich was uh, was was at that that meeting was um, he kind of went back to his uh, an important part of his uh, his work is is a uh, is performance, which I think mm -hmm. um, he is, you know, he, it's almost as if he's created a genre, which uh, which we you know, we've seen uh, uh, Stashuk engage in, where uh, the idea is that a poet has to have a band, you know. So uh, so uh, so his the band that he was performing with was uh, was Carbido at that time. Uh, there's also if you uh, if our viewers look on um, you know look on the internet, uh, you can find uh, recordings of uh, Stashuk reading. Um, in our last episode, we were, which was on Mitskevich, we were focusing on uh, the Crimean sonnets. Um, and uh, in fact, you can find Stashuk reading one of the, uh, or reciting one of the uh, uh, Crimean sonnets, the uh, Steps of Ackermann, um, with, uh, with a band called uh, Haida Maki, uh, which is a Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian ensemble. Um, and uh, they are like reciting it in, in the refrain of, of, the, of the 
the song, the music that they produce uh, in Ukrainian, um, and uh, and also uh, the uh, premier uh, poet uh, of uh, you know the the current situation in Ukraine, Sergei Zhadan. Uh, he also has uh, had a band, uh, um, uh, which is called. Uh, Jadan so and, first uh, and was the dogs. Sobake, of course, we see dogs in space, and now it's just Jadan is Sobake, Jadan and the dogs. Jadan and the dogs, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's you know it's it's its own thing. And I have some recording from from that. If uh, if you want to, if you want to, uh, I, I shared it with you in advance of our discussion. Uh, would you like to look at a section of that? Sure, we can do that. Uh, Basically, uh, this is uh, something that Andrukovich really excelled with early on. So by, by the time this recording took place, this is an established genre. Uh, probably the backstory that we would need to say is that in uh, the mid-1980s, uh, Andrukovich, together with two other uh, young writers, primarily poets at the time, like he was, um, Oh, Alexander Irvanets and Viktor Nebrak established a poetry group they called Buba Bu, and the abbreviation st uh, stands for Burlesque Balahan Bufonada. So burlesque, uh, sort of uh, show booth uh, entertainment and buffoonery. And they very much... Uh, embraced the ideas of the carnivalesque uh, and uh, carnival and subversion of traditional hierarchies. They then uh, performed in the early 90s, uh, especially in 92, right after, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union at the um, celebrated Vivich Theater Festival. So Vivich has a dislocation as in dislocating a joint. Uh, it was at the Lviv Opera, and uh, uh, so the, the event was called Poesa Opera Chrysler Imperial, and the, there's a whole mythology about this early 1930s Chrysler Imperial car that somehow made it into Ukraine, and uh, so that place of a poet on stage in uh, combination with theater and music uh, is part of that early legacy. And then when Andruhovich befriended the musicians, uh, Polish musicians from Carbido, this uh, gave rise to a new wave of that and several projects. They've released several CDs jointly. And this is a result of uh, one of those collaborations. <laughs> Roll. 
what was going on there? What was the what was the poem about? Um, my Ukrainian certainly isn't uh, isn't enough to, uh, to 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 catch all that while he's singing and there's music in the background and uh, and so forth. Uh, this is this is from uh, Perversia, his uh, his novel. Yes. Uh, so this is from his third novel, uh, Perversia, uh, which is set in mostly in Venice, and it's about a a Ukrainian writer, uh, Stanislav Perfetsky, who is invited to a strange festival slash conference in Venice. He travels to Venice via Germany, sort of in a roundabout way, and uh, he uh, arrives there and um, all sorts of strange things happen. So there is something definitely uh, diabolical going on, uh, and uh, there is very much religious symbolism, and uh, about, and this is part of the larger, I think, myth that uh, animates a lot of Andrukhovich's uh, writing, and this is the myth of Orpheus, and Orpheus's journey to the underworld and coming back, so and the encounter of that, uh, which is very much Schultz. like Schultz's uh, Schultz's voyage to the sanatorium. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. So, so this is uh, one of the things that is happening there, as on the road to Venice, uh, as he's driving, or rather being driven as a passenger from Munich to Venice and crossing the Alps. Uh, he is uh, trying to compose a poem. Uh, oh, Italy, why, why, why do I love you so? And that uh, we're sort of in the process of that monologue of him trying to compose the poem, being frustrated with the poem, trying to twist that poem. And uh, it becomes more of a... Yes, a performative gesture. So it's a performative in multiple philosophical senses of that. So he is creating a poetic gesture, a cultural gesture in the process uh, as it happens and simultaneously reflects on what is going on. So in that sense, Andruhovich is very much a postmodernist writer in that sense that this is self-conscious literature, literature that is very much aware of its own process of creation and that constantly engages in uh, cultural dialogue and intertextual dialogue with uh, other eras, other cultures, other writers and specific works and other things that are more broad mass cultural stereotypes. And uh, it simultaneously sort of hails them and uh, evokes them and subverts them, uh, ridicules them. So it is this complex and ambiguous engagement that reaches really this kind of virtuoso fireworks level in many of his works. And I would say Perversie is one of the most complex in that respect. Is it translated into English? Yes, uh, it was translated by Michael Naidan and it was published in uh, uh, the uh, series of East European literature that was uh, came out from Northwestern University uh, Press for a while, Writings from an Unbound Europe. So it's one of the two Ukrainian volumes in that series. Great. Well, we'll include it in our uh, bibliography on the uh, introductory page on the uh, Polish Cultural Institute's website. Um, along those lines of uh, engaged of self-conscious literature um, uh, and uh, literature that engages with stereotypes in in interesting ways and uh, and uh, and so forth, I, maybe we could look at your translation of. Um, of his uh, his story Samilo or the beautiful brigand, um, which uh, which is uh, set in the 17th century, um, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in almost in the the style of uh, of um, 
a chronicle of uh, of that era. It's kind of picaresque, not unlike uh, in Polish, uh, Jan Pasek's uh, Baroque memoir. Um, uh, Pasek's memoir is uh, is uh, famous for um, uh, being an example uh, exemplar of the example of the uh, style of the gavenda uh, in Polish, which is often compared to the skaz in Russian, where the most important characteristic of the uh, of the narration is the style of the narrator more than what the narrator is saying or the plot. Um, except this work is in third person, so we have kind of picaresque. Uh, we uh, we have a uh, a, uh, a kind of narrative protagonist who is uh, very colorful and telling you know, tall tales, very much like uh, like Pasek. Uh, Pasek's story was also uh, his memoir was also the model for uh, Gombrowicz's uh, uh, *Transatlantic*, another kind of uh, kind of postmodern fiction set in an anachronistic style. Um, so, so what's going on in San Milo? Well, uh, this is uh, a text that indeed. Uh, tries to engage with all of those things. For Ukrainian culture, uh, the Baroque era is especially important because in the Renaissance era, it did not achieve those heights that we have in Polish literature, let's say Kochanowski and things like that. But with the Baroque, we have a richness of original Ukrainian culture in one of Andrukhovich's poems, Listy of Ukraine, uh, Letters to Ukraine, he even says, Ukraina Baroko. Ukraine is the country of the Baroque. So the Baroque era, uh, 17th century in particular, becomes a crucial place for Ukrainian cultural mythology of a <coughs> time of cultural diversity, uh, free and open development of things in global engagement, open to global engagement with many different places around the world. And uh, there is definitely here echoes of things that you have said. Yes, there is uh, an echo of uh, the Polish Baroque tale and of the Gavenda specifically and Pasek. And yes, there is the presence of Gombrowicz and Transatlantic because uh, there is definitely uh, the play with uh, time. I mean, in the story, uh, characters call each other on the telephone. Uh, one of the city streets is named after Lenin. Uh, there they use, I think, tear gas at one point and stuff like that. So there are a lot of things that are chronologically impossible. There is also a character who is called the Portuguese Moor Joelinho, who I think is very much a reference to Gonzalo in uh, uh, Transatlantic uh, by uh, Gombrowicz. Uh, so there is that uh, connection. And there is another connection to Argentina, to Gombrowicz's great rival, Borges, of whom he made such funny transatlantic, because uh, the, one of Borges's books that established his um, canonical reputation is this early collection from the mid-1930s called The Universal History of Infamy. And this is a book of semi-fictionalized short stories about famous outrageous criminals. And so what Andruhovich does in this story, he basically has Borges and Gabrovich, if you were, collaborate on the story set in uh, 17th century Galicia. And uh, so we have something that is a little bit in the Borges mode and a little bit in the Gabrovich transatlantic mode at the same time. And, but from a perspective, and the, the main character is a Ukrainian within this diverse multicultural space that was, uh, you know, Galicia at that time in the early 17th century. Uh, however, within that multiculturalism, there's his awareness of his Ukrainianness that is 
uh, something that the text emphasizes. So within that multicultural space, what frustrates and subverts the main character uh, who is, uh, it's at in Galicia, but he is from Nemeriv, so he's from Podolia or Podilia, so which was also, of course, uh, part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth at the time. And, uh, and he is unable to fully realize himself to achieve greatness as uh, some of the other outrageous characters that Borges wrote about his book, uh, Universal History of Infamy, uh, did because uh, he happened, had the fortune or the misfortune to be Ukrainian and to represent the ethnic community and the culture that uh, was uh, curtailed in what it paths of development were available to it at the time. So what happens is that the text becomes what uh, one of uh, the greatest American literary scholars of our time, Frederick Jameson, is called national allegory. Whereas the story of one individual, uh, you know, and out the story that can be seen silly and funny and over the top and playful and otherwise fun, uh, becomes an allegorical tale about a history of a particular community. I know you studied at Duke. Um, was Jameson your dissertation advisor? Uh, no, I was at Duke only for my uh, oh, for your undergrad my That's studies. Right. I then continued to the University of Pennsylvania. But yes, it was studying with him that uh, very much influenced me deeply. Out of all the professors who have ever commented on my work as a student, his was the most constructive and the most detailed commentary I've ever received. It was two pages, single spaced. Uh, I believe it may have been still typed on a typewriter because we're talking about 1990. And uh, it uh, was incredibly generous intellectually for someone who's just a kid like me and who really, uh, looking back, you know, I had no idea what I was talking about, but he was incredibly kind and supportive. I think we've all had those, uh, those moments. What was your paper about? That he commented on. It was actually on um, modernism and modernity and Yevgeny Zemetin, the Russian writer, and his uh, idea of uh, modernity and critique of that in dystopian in we. You know, since you know this is your translation, uh, first of all, where, where is Samuel published? Is it part of an anthology? Uh, it was published first in a journal uh, called Ukrainian Literature, a journal of translations, uh, which is published out of the University of Toronto, and it exists both in a print version and an electronic version. An electronic version is open access. It has we'll, also not we'll put been it in the bibliography. It has been selected to be reprinted in a new fundraising anthology of Ukrainian short stories that is being brought out by Deep Vellum Press, a wonderful independent uh, publisher based in Texas. And they're doing an anthology of Ukrainian short stories uh, right now as a fundraising event to help uh, Ukraine at this difficult time. I'm wondering, uh, since since it is your translation, would you like to read some? I, I think uh, dealing with that issue of the of national allegory, uh, maybe that section just just at the end, that last page from gradually coming to the conclusion. Sure, he had to drink to the bottom of the that bitter cup of tragedy that all great men share in congruity with the time into which they were thrown by providence. But the bitterness of the Medici's cup is of a double nature. One not only of time, but also of place. Samuel Nemeric had the misfortune of being a Ukrainian and living in a Ukraine devoid of its own statehood, jurisprudence, its own history, and finally of its own criminal world. In America, he could have been a president. In Rome, a pope or at least a cardinal. In England, he could have been Robin Hood. In Germany, Bismarck or even Goebbels. But in Ukraine, he could only be a bandit and a pogromist. There was indeed a ring of, tr of truth to the Polish saying from that era, so Jesuits in Ruthenia and you will still reap thieves. 
Samila Lemerich was tonsured as a monk on 18th of October of 1619, and under the name of Brother Theodosius, he quietly spent the rest of his years in a cell at the Pochayev Lavra Monastery. After his death in January 1632 from an unknown nocturnal illness documented minute by minute by a hidden camera with the intention of a future upload to YouTube, his body did not decay and on a fifth day, retaining its resilience and warmth, it began to smell of hollyhocks. He was not, however, canonized despite the expressiveness of this unambiguous anomaly. Allegedly, the reason was that his birth certificate was nowhere to be found. Gradually, people stopped believing in the very fact of his existence. When was this written? This was written in the early 1990s and first published in 1995. It was then revised slightly and incorporated as the opening chapter in his novel in stories called Kohansi Justitsi, Darlings of Justice, which I'm translating right now. Uh, I've translated another story, self-standing story that is part of this book, uh, Maria's Life or Mario. And this uh, new book was published in 2018. That's uh, so... All of this thing, these things that people are hearing in the news now about mm -hmm. uh, whether or not, uh, you know, Ukraine is a country, whether Ukraine exists is an ongoing discourse, an ongoing discussion. Right. I mean, this whole issue of, you know, Ukraine devoid of its own, devoid of its own statehood, of its own history and so forth uh, is a well established problem. And the, the threat is is of, you know, will people stop believing in the very fact of its existence, right? I mean, that, that's, uh, that seems to be something that's absolutely present and even, you know, in these works from, you know, from 1990. And I'm sure we could go back much further and find, uh, find uh, further examples of uh, the ongoing question of whether, whether uh, Ukraine exists as a country. And that is a uh, very true, unfortunately, and this is a persistent issue of the, I mean, people have long talked about the question of the so-called non-state nations in the wake of uh, sort of the uh, national revivals in Europe in the early 19th century. And some uh, countries have been more successful than others. Slovenia, for example, has not ever been an independent state uh, until the uh, disintegration of Yugoslavia, but I don't think anybody questions that Slovenia exists right now. And in the case of Ukraine, I think the events uh, since February 24th of this year proved to the whole world that this is a place very much that exists, that it has its own agency, that it has its own identity, that it has its own set of values, that the world uh, with sometimes with bewilderment, sometimes with fascination, some perhaps with annoyance are uh, finding out that it is there and that it uh, needs, its agency needs to be recognized and it needs to be seen as a member of the global family of nations. I remember um, I was um, uh, leading a, a group of uh, scholars and, and people in, in culture, museums and so forth uh, to um, uh, to Poland and uh, and Ukraine about 10 years ago when I was working uh, directly for the Polish Cultural Institute. Um, and uh, we visited the uh, Center for Urban History in Lviv, uh, which is really a wonderfully vibrant uh, you know, intellectual center uh, in Europe, just broadly. I mean, people thinking really brilliantly about, you know, about becoming, you know, about what it means to be a young democracy, um, about and, you know, what's the relationship of that uh, democracy to history, particularly given the, you know, the changes in, uh, in borders that we've, uh, we've talked about. And I remember... Uh, um, one of the uh, one of the people from the center, um, you know, expressing a certain amount of uh, pessimism about you know making progress um, in uh, in Ukraine at that time. This is remember about ten years ago. Um, so you know, there's this you know uh, feeling of revolution and so forth, but uh, um, but uh, not quite the atmosphere now, and not the well established uh, you know sort of 
build building of you know democracy that's happened since then uh and there you know i remember uh, this this person saying saying well you know right now we're we're just trying to create a civil society we don't have a civil society and i'm thinking gosh what is you know more, I mean, this is the civil society right mm-hmm. there happening at the uh, at the uh, Center for Urban History. Um, I mean, that was, uh, um, you know, I mean, some of the most intellectually engaged people I know uh, mm-hmm. were were coming out of that very vibrant uh, atmosphere of uh, uh, Ukraine um, after the Orange Revolution and so forth. Um, uh, very much engaged with uh, the idea of, you know, they, they had problems that mattered. <laughs> let's, yes. let's put it that way. Yes, and uh, this is, you were there uh, shortly before the next, the Revolution of Dignity, the yes. Yevro Maidan, the, uh, the Revolution of Winter 13 14, after which, unfortunately, the first Russian invasion began. Uh, so, uh, in that uh, period, in the space of the last eight or so years, Ukrainian society and Ukrainian culture have undergone a huge journey in that the development and growth of civil society, of all the horizontal institutions, of all the grounds up institutions, uh, of people organizing themselves and doing things uh, happened at such a fast pace that uh, a lot of, of even sympathetic observers from the outside who have not experienced the place firsthand in the last eight years would be shocked and surprised to the degree of change that uh, took place. And the Center for Urban History of East Central Europe uh, is a wonderful institution which used to be sort of an island, an anomaly in a sense. And I think uh, your uh, visit there and the uh, words of the fine folks associated with that place uh, from 10 years ago would be a testimony to that. They're no longer an isolated island in that respect. And you see all across Ukraine in many different regions, uh, including much further east, uh, before uh, this horrible war, Mariupol, a city that uh, right now looks like Warsaw at the end of World War II to the kind of destruction that Russia has brought on the city was a very vibrant city with public spaces, with uh, platforms for uh, art and cultural innovations and so on and so forth. My native city of Odessa has also undergone a very significant transformation and uh, really broke out of its post-Soviet malaise that unfortunately sort of dominated the city's cultural life for a long time and also became a very forward-looking and innovative uh, place culturally, both especially visible in the transformation of its art museum, but also in many other cultural spaces, including literary festivals. How is Odessa at the moment? Odessa has not uh, yet uh, sustained uh, major damage. There has been shelling uh, from the sea, but it's been very minor. As analysts estimate, more than 60% of Russian missiles um, miss their targets or fall unexploded. Uh, But uh, there have been some of the sort of summer homes right on the coast that were damaged in shelling a few days ago. Other than that, the city is uh, very nervous. I mean, there are sandbags all over the place uh, in front of the opera house, the famous Potomkin steps and at the statue of Duke de Richelieu, who in exile from Napoleon was uh, the mayor of the city. And, uh, And of course, Mykolaiv, a city which is just about two hours drive to the east, is a place of of very serious fighting and of really horrible Russian artillery shelling. So the war is quite close, even though the city has not yet sustained the kind of intense uh, Russian attacks that other Ukrainian cities have. And of course, it is blockaded from the sea 
and Odessa's essence as being a port, of being an open city uh, that communicates to the world through the sea. And because of the Russian Navy and of them mining the sea, the port has stopped. I should say we're recording on uh, March 25th, um, and the planned release for this is on about uh, April 1st. So um, we don't know what's going to happen between uh, now and then. It's a very uh, fluid situation. Um, maybe on that note, we can look at the poem that recently appeared um, in the New York Re Review of Books, Set Change, um, uh, translated by uh, John Hennessy and Ostap Kin. Um, Let's see. Uh, one of us should read it. Would you like to read it? or? Uh, sure. Let me just pull it up one second. I have the original here. I don't have the uh, translation. When was the original written? The original is actually from the late 80s. It's wow. uh, from his... Uh, one second. Uh, yes, it is uh, from his uh, third... A collection of poems uh, called Exotichni Ptechi Iroslini. Um, and uh, so it was uh, published uh, shortly before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, this is sort of the peak of Andruhovich of his Bubabu period. Uh, in terms of his poetry writing. He sort of has these two distinct periods. He wrote a lot of poetry in the 80s, early 90s. And this is a poem representative from that time. Uh, he then switched entirely to prose. He then came back to poetry in the early 2000s. And then again, that actually was a Polish influence. And uh, so perhaps it's worthwhile for us to mention that Andruhovich was hugely influenced by the Polish Oharaists, the Oharisti, like Martin uh, Shvetlitsky and Jacek Pachadwo, uh, and uh, the famous issue of Literatura na Świecie from 1986, which brought the New York School of Poetry to Poland, uh, to Polish readership. And it was through that journal issue that Andruhovich and other Ukrainian poets discovered American poetry. And then when he came to the US on a Fulbright uh, he, in 2000, 2001, he worked on an anthology of uh, American poetry uh, uh, from the 1950s, 1960s, including the New York School, the Beats and the Black Mountain poets. So uh, this poetry from the early 2000s is very much influenced by that American poetry that he was working for in the anthology. Uh, but in turn, that happened because of that encounter that was mediated by Polish poetry earlier. But this poem, uh, Set Changes, Mina Dekorazzi, is from the earlier period. But uh, this is something that, uh, Interesting that how uh, earlier poem uh, becomes something that is very relevant now. So it's not unlike um, Adam Zagajewski's poem, Try to Praise the Mutilated World, which uh, was written well in advance of 9-11, but became the iconic poem of that era, uh, even though it was about a completely different situation. So, yeah. So why don't you pull it up? Uh, maybe you can read it and, and talk yes. what it was originally about. And then we can maybe see what it uh, why it suddenly has resonance now. Well, uh, this uh, the poem is written in uh, at the time when uh, we are reflecting uh, in the case of the end of Soviet rule on the damage that uh, the Soviet society did to earlier culture. Uh, it was quite typical to use church buildings, for instance, for museums, for gyms, uh, for grain storage, for you know, planetariums, uh, things of that nature. Uh, so uh, it starts with that uh, Soviet reality and the absurdity of that reality and this is, again, the absurdity that we 
see depicted in the works of uh, Polish writers uh, writing uh, from the late co communist era, like Konvitsky, for example. Uh, and uh, so uh, this uh, paradoxical incongruity and not fitting the situation. And with the case of uh, in Russian culture, having an active and aggressive restoration of the Soviet idea pursued now by uh, President Putin and uh, his inner circle, this Soviet, the Soviet echoes acquire new really intense relevance. And so I'm glad that uh, Ostap King and John Hennessy, uh, who are a wonderful translator team, uh, who have earlier worked together on a book of selected poetry by Serhii Jadan, uh, have uh, now turned their attention to the early poems of Andruhovich. Ostap and I previously collaborated on another book of poetry by Andruhovich. Uh, I can hold it up which, here. So uh, yes, Songs, for, um, a songs for a Dead Rooster from 2018. And now I'll stop together with John Hennessy is working on a second volume, which will have more of his poetry, primarily from that early period. Zmina decorati. U приміщенні церкви відкрита вокзал. Почекальні, лампади, ікони, кабіни. Перелюднені гори гудуть, мов казан, а в касирок вуста, як фальшиві рубіни. Туалети і фрески, колишня зоря закотилась у тлін, мов Марія у чорні. Відчиняєш, як двері в врата вівтаря, і виходиш, і ходиш по першій платформі. А на ній протяги, протяги, свічок пересохлі світла, як пісні на бенкеті. Облягаєм вагон, і свистить у сюрчок пролетарський пророк у червонім кашкеті. У приміщенні школи відкрита готель, та там завжди хтось із кимсь укладається спати. Сталактита волого пульсують зі стель, старшокласниці прагнуть солодкої вати і, сплітаючи русла заламаних рук, опановують суд природничих наук. У приміщенні замку відкрито шпиталь, там гуляє лицарство в потертих піжамах, мов побите вогнем чи познімене спаль, і діагноз готують на них ніби замах, адже в кожній з нічних півосвітлених веж їх лікують від стиду. І цвяхави теж. У приміщенні цирку відкрито завод, там летить над верстатами гордий народ у блискучому гримі від вуха до вуха. У приміщенні неба відкрито тюрму, у приміщенні тіла відкрито пітьму, у приміщенні духу відкрито розруху. It's good. I'm glad you read it in the original because you can, you know, you can hear the, the echo of, of, uh, of um... Andrukhovich's cadence from the uh, from the passage that he read himself with uh, with uh, with Carbido. The translation uh, by uh, John Hennessy and Ostap King set change. Within the church, they opened a train station, waiting room, altar lamps, icons, and booths. The crowded choir buzzed like a cauldron, and female cashiers with mouths like false rubies. Restrooms and frescoes. The Christmas star turned to ash, like Mary dressed in black. Open the altar gates like doors, exit and walk down the first platform. And there, trains and wind before rain, the light from candles guttering like voices at a banquet. We cluster around the car and blowing a whistle, a proletarian prophet in a red service cap. Within the school, they open a hotel. Someone gets ready to sleep with somebody. Wet stalactites pulsate from the ceiling. High school girls crave cotton candy and twisting the channels of intertwined arms master the essence of the natural sciences. Within the castle, they open a hospital. Their chivalry rambles in shabby pajamas as if beaten by fire plucked from a stake and they prepare the di a diagnosis like planning a murder because at night in each of the dimly lit towers, chivalry is treated for shame with hammer and nails. Within the circus, they opened a factory. There are proud people fly over the lathes in gaudy clown makeup from ear to ear. Within the sky, they opened a prison. Within the body, they opened darkness. Within the spirit, they opened bedlam.
that really does, um, you know, when we're seeing um, situations of, you know, basically any standing structure being turned into a shelter um, uh, in a, a very different fashion from what mm-hmm. happened uh, in the, in the, you know, uh, beginning of the Soviet period, uh, what resonance that has for now. Yes, you are right. And thank you for the analogy with uh, let us uh, praise the mutilated world because indeed uh, the poem here, which was written in a completely different context over 30 years ago, is just gets totally new and fresh and relevant sound because of the turmoil of war and the tragedy of uh, indiscriminate attacks, because uh, the Russian bombing and shelling of uh, cultural institutions, of hospitals, of houses of worship of all religions, um, of theaters, of museums, um, has been just absolutely atrocious and heartbreaking. And indeed, the preciousness of human life, uh, but also of all the memories. I have so many friends now who have lost everything they had. And some of them, because they were very active, you know, in the cultural world, for instance, had extensive libraries or extensive art collections. And those are completely obliterated. And um, the value of human life is greater than the value of a material object, but the loss of material culture is also a terrible, terrible tragedy that links the current war with uh, the barbarism of earlier wars like World War II, which are very much familiar to us and which I think is especially resonant for people of Poland and uh, people with ties to Poland uh, because of the amount of tragedy Poland sustained in World War II. Certainly the scenes that we saw of people um, hiding artworks, altar pieces from the Armenian church in, uh, mm-hmm. in Lviv uh, were very reminiscent of the, the stories we have of people um, hiding artworks uh, in Krakow, uh, mm-hmm. you know, at the beginning of World War II, um, you know, before, you know, the, the Germans could, you know, destroy everything. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's why Krakow is so uh, well preserved. But the, you know, the, the echo is, is, astonishing. Um, So um, obviously this is uh, uh, going to create a lot of interest uh, right now um, in uh, in Ukraine and Ukrainian studies, people wanting to learn more about Ukraine. That's why we're doing this series of uh, special episodes on uh, Ukraine and its connections to Poland. Um, If people want to study uh, study Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian culture, Ukrainian literature at uh, Kansas University, uh, what can you tell them about the program? Yes, here at the University of Kansas, we are fortunate as that one, we are one of the oldest and most established uh, programs uh, for this in the United States. And uh, we have now um, our Ukrainian language classes available fully online, and they're open to folks uh, from outside the university. Uh, We have a full-level program of uh, Ukrainian language and culture offerings that we only plan to grow. In uh, better times, we also have the only study abroad program run in in Ukraine in-house by an American university, which is based in Lviv. And uh, uh, so we hope that Uh, that will be resumed as soon as it is safe to resume so. And right now we are in the process of signing a new cooperation agreement with the Kyiv School of Economics, another wonderful university that has been doing a lot of great things. So we hope that on the basis of that partnership, we'll be growing more opportunities uh, in the very near future. 
that's really, uh, really wonderful that those opportunities exist. Um, so thanks, Vitaly. Thanks for joining us uh, here on Encounters with Polish Literature, or as we're calling it for these special episodes, Encounters with Polish and Ukrainian Literature. Thank you so much. It is my pleasure and honor. And uh, thank you to all the viewers for the interest. And I hope this inspires you to discover more of the riches that uh, Ukrainian literature and culture have to offer. Wait, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to receive notifications about new videos from the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Go to the Polish Cultural Institute's website linked in the description below to see a full schedule of upcoming episodes. Stay tuned for the credits for some recommendations about how you can support humanitarian aid for Ukraine and for Ukrainians fleeing the war in their country. I'd like to thank all the people who helped to make this series possible. Our sponsor, the Polish Cultural Institute New York, is directed by Robert Szaniawski. Bartek Remisko, head of humanities and literature at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, suggested this series and acts as our executive producer. My fellow producer, Natalia Iudin, handles all the video editing, technical, and aesthetic aspects of this production. Claudia Juana Draber, head of communications at the Polish Cultural Institute New York, keeps us all informed about upcoming episodes of Encounters with Polish Literature and other events organized by the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Thank you all for listening and reading along with us. We have episodes in the works now about Janna Swonyowska, a Polish-Ukrainian writer who writes in Polish and recently had an op-ed in the New York Times. Joseph Conrad, a Polish writer whom I'm sure many of you know from his novels in English. And poet memoirist Alexander Vat, who was to have been our topic for today, but will be back on the schedule as soon as we can arrange it. See you in a month. <laughs>